In recent phases of evolution, the superior mammals added a new stratum of brain cells which formed the neocortex, the region for higher cognitive abilities that allow for planning, understanding, and developing willpower. The place for thinking is found in the neocortex. If with the limbic structure, love is pleasure and sexual desire, its connection to the neocortex also causes the feelings or the desire for commitment in order to establish family and emotional bonds. The human brain and that of the chimpanzee are barely distinguishable by just looking at them. Both have a brainstem, a limbic system, and a brain cortex. There's nothing in physiology that justifies such great differences in their abilities and behavior. In cellular and molecular terms, the brains of a human and the brain of a chimpanzee are very identical, almost identical. No neuroanatomist, given an, a microscope picture of a nerve cell from a chimpanzee or from a chick, which are the young animals that I work with, or a human, could tell you which was which. The differences lie in the range and the wealth, the richness of the connections between the cells. It is not even clear um, what are the differences. It's clearly, again, our cortex is much more developed than the cortex of the apes, the neocortex. But very likely, the difference is essentially a quantitative difference. It's not that we have something different from the apes. It's that we have more of the same. Okay, we have more neurons, we have more of neocortex, so we can do more things, more complex things than the ape can. But the basic tools, the basic pieces, they are the same. The brain cortex in humans makes up about 76% of the brain, while in chimpanzees it only makes up 72%. This small difference of barely 4% in the development of the neocortex seems to be the key for the distance between human beings and other primates. The more neocortex there is, the higher number of cells there are and connections among them. As a result, there is a greater ability for observation, reflection, and learning. Apes can create images in their mind that reproduce reality, but human beings can also elaborate symbols and concepts, representations of this reality that are more or less abstract which allows them to make observations with a broader point of view. While an orangutan feels anger, it is overwhelmed by the emotion. This can also happen to human beings, but they are the only ones that can reflect on the concept of anger or even modify their behavior after this reflection. The distance between this angry ape and the human who controls his anger is greater when the human can also transmit and teach its peers the advantages and inconveniences of anger. Greater communication, higher learning, and better permeability in the environment have allowed humans to develop cultures an intellectual knowledge that completes and enriches the biological knowledge and the personal instinct of the species. And just like genes, culture can be transmitted from parents to children. And thanks to this, 
children can broaden the limited knowledge of past generations. This does not happen in any other animal community. The other extraordinary thing about humans in particular, unlike any other animal, is because we have not only our own individual memories in our heads, but because we have memories which are created socially by writing, by television, by radio, by the media, by the historical record, our memories, unlike any other species, are also social and historical. They don't begin and end with our own deaths. Does the brain change as more knowledge is acquired? Children go to school. Would they have the same brain if they didn't go? The degree of influence that the environment and culture have on the human brain is another area for scientific debate. Controversy arises between those who defend that we are a result of genetic inheritance and those who believe that the brain is molded, especially with real experiences and the information received from the surrounding world. The idea that the brain is a blank page is not true. We have a series of elements recorded in the brain, meaning that we learn to walk without needing to be taught, and that we learn to talk without needing to be explicitly taught. In that, when we receive certain information, we are able to talk. The fact is that the brain has a series of patterns of activity, behavioral patterns that are pre-recorded. To put it popularly, which are genetically inherited, and which are the result of evolution and the result of selection. I think we have to accept that. Without a doubt, it is a brain that has a determined type of patterns and a great complexity within these patterns, recorded in a genetic way, but which may or may not be expressed according to the influences from the outside world. It's a little bit like a computer. There is the hardware and there is the software. The hardware is how the brain is constructed, how, how the, the material is there. And this is genetically determined because your brain is made like mine. And all humans within one species, we all have the same brain. So it means there is a genetic determinism. And all birds have the same brain and snakes have the same brains and so on and so forth. But the software, that is what you are filling your brain with, what gives rise to emotions, to memory, to thinking, to the perception of things from the outside, that of course is not genetically determined. This is the result of your environment. Now what is very interesting is that there are theories in uh, neurobiology which are linking these two things and which are proposing that the environment is taking part in building the brain. That is, that in fact the software would take part, would participate to make the hardware of the computer. Santiago Ramón y Cajal, winner of the Nobel Prize in 1906, demonstrated that the nervous system and the brain were made up of cells, just like the rest of living tissues. These cells were called neurons, and the connections between them the synapses. Together, they are the brain's foundation for functionality. Everything that takes place inside the brain can be described as a large network of electric impulses and chemical reactions between the neurons. There are thousands of millions of neurons and they are organized in microscopic circuits that at the same time are organized in successive systems which are becoming larger and more complex every day. Neurons have specialized extensions called axons which send out information and dendrites which receive data from other brain cells. When a neuron transmits electric impulses to another neuron 
The synapsis releases neurotransmitters, chemical substances that help transmit the message to the receiver area of another neuron. <laughs>